terms that will likely be vivid and personal. I will ask you this question. You know, I mean, as we've said it now dozens of times, Hillary Clinton, of course, has been waiting for this, preparing for it, stealing herself for it. Clearly, she prepares like crazy. All of these issues have been, I'm sure, litigated and practiced, but it is a different thing when it's game time and you have to get out there in front of 60, 70, 80 million people, and Donald Trump has just done this thing he did before yeah. the debate, she's going to be, this is going to feel not like a debate, like a practice session. This is going to feel like a different thing for her if she's asked about these things either by Trump, the moderators, or someone in the crowd. And as meticulous and careful as her team is, certainly they've tried to think of every possible way Donald Trump could broach these issues. And they didn't think of this one. And, well, they certainly didn't, probably didn't think of the press conference. conference but, that's what I mean. But, but as, you, as you said a couple times, is, is this a situation in which all the preparation in the world can't truly prepare. There you see Ivanka Trump and Eric Trump and Melania Trump. A situation where all the preparation in the world can't truly prepare you. The other family, the Clintons there. This is going to be quite an evening, not just for the people on the stage, as we've said, but for the people in the front row of this hall, the family members who are going to watch an unpredictable situation. All right. The second presidential debate is about to begin here in St. Louis. We are going to be broadcasting that live on Bloomberg Television and also on Twitter. It's going to be on live on the stream all night long. You can watch it, as I said, either on Bloomberg Television or on Twitter, and then we're going to be uh, back afterwards. We're going to the debate hall now. We will see you Good on evening. the other side. I'm Martha Raddatz from ABC News. And I'm Anderson Cooper from CNN. We want to welcome you to Washington University in St. Louis for the second presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. Tonight's debate is a town hall format, which gives voters a chance to directly ask the candidates questions. Martha and I will ask follow-up questions, but the night really belongs to the people in this room and to people across the country who have submitted questions online. The people you see on this stage were chosen by the Gallup organization. They are all from the St. Louis area and told Gallup they haven't committed to a candidate. Each of them came here with questions they want to ask, and we saw those questions for the first time this morning. Anderson and I and our team from ABC and CNN are the only ones who have seen them. Both candidates will have two minutes to answer each audience and online question. We hope to get to as many questions as we can, so we've asked the audience here not to slow things down with any applause except for now. Ladies and gentlemen, the Republican nominee for President Donald J. Trump and the Democratic nominee for President Hillary Clinton. Thank you very much for being here. We're going to begin with a uh, question from uh, one of the members in our town hall. Uh, each of you will have two minutes to respond to this question. Secretary Clinton, you won the coin toss, so you'll go first. Our first question comes from Patrice Brock. Patrice? Thank you, and good evening. The last presidential debate could have been no rated as MA, mature audiences, per TV parental guidelines. Knowing that educators assign viewing the presidential debates as students' homework, do you feel you're modeling appropriate and positive behavior for today's youth? Well, thank you. Are, are you a teacher? Um, yes, I think that that's a very good question because I've heard from lots of teachers and parents about some of their concerns about some of the things that are being said and done uh, in this campaign. Uh, and I think it is very important for us to make clear to our children that our country really is great because we're good. And we are going to respect one another, lift each other up. We are going to be looking for ways to celebrate our diversity. And we are going to try to reach out to every boy and girl as well as every adult. Uh, to bring them in to working on behalf of our country. I have a very positive and optimistic view about what we can do together. That's why the slogan of my campaign is Stronger Together, 
because I think if we work together, if we overcome the divisiveness that sometimes sets Americans against one another, and instead we make some big goals, and I've set forth some big goals, getting the economy to work for everyone, not just those at the top, making sure that we have the best education system from preschool through college and making it affordable, and so much else. If we set those goals and we go together to try to achieve them, there's nothing, in my opinion, that America can't do. So that's why I hope that we will come together in this campaign. Obviously, I'm hoping to earn your vote. I'm hoping to be elected in November. And I can promise you, I will work with every American. I want to be the president for all Americans, regardless of your political beliefs, where you come from, what you look like, your religion. I want us to heal our country and bring it together because that's, I think, the best way for us to get the future that our children and our grandchildren deserve. Secretary Clinton, thank you. Mr. Trump, you have two minutes. Well, I actually agree with that. I agree with everything she said. Uh, I began this campaign because I was so tired of seeing such foolish things happen to our country. This is a great country. This is a great land. I've gotten to know the people of the country over the last year and a half that I've been doing this as a politician. I cannot believe I'm saying that about myself, but I guess I have been a politician. And my whole concept was to make America great again. When I watch the deals being made, when I watch what's happening with some horrible things like Obamacare, where your health insurance and health care is going up by numbers that are astronomical, 68 percent, 59 percent, 71 percent. When I look at the Iran deal and how bad a deal it is for us, it's a one-sided transaction where we're giving back $150 billion to a terrorist state, really the number one terrorist state. We've made them a strong country from really a very weak country just three years ago. When I look at all of the things that I see and all of the potential that our country has, we have such tremendous potential whether it's in business and trade, where we're doing so badly. Last year, we had an almost $800 billion trade deficit. In other words, trading with other countries, we had an $800 billion deficit. It's hard to believe. Inconceivable. You say, who's making these deals? We're going to make great trade deals. We're going to have a strong border. We're going to bring back law and order. Just today, a policeman was shot, two killed. And this is happening on a weekly basis. We have to bring back respect to law enforcement. At the same time, we have to take care of people on all sides. We need justice. But I want to do things that haven't been done, including fixing and making our inner cities better for the African-American citizens that are so great, and for the Latinos, Mr. Hispanics. Trump. And uh, I look forward to doing it. It's called Make America Great Again. Thank you, Mr. Trump. The question from Patrice was about, are you both modeling positive and appropriate behaviors for today's youth? We received a lot of questions online, Mr. Trump, about the tape that was released on Friday. As you can imagine, you called what you said locker room banter. You described kissing women without consent, grabbing their genitals. That is sexual assault. You bragged that you have sexually assaulted women. Do you understand that? No, I didn't say that at all. I don't think you understood what was said. This was locker room talk. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I apologize to my family. I apologize to the American people. Certainly, I'm not proud of it, but this is locker room talk. You know, when we have a world where you have ISIS chopping off heads, where you have, and frankly, drowning people in steel cages, where you have wars and, and horrible, horrible sights all over, where you have so many bad things happening. This is like medieval times. We haven't seen anything like this, the carnage all over the world. And they look and they see. Can you imagine the people that are frankly doing so well against us with ISIS. And they look at our country and they see what's going on. Yes, I'm very embarrassed by it. I hate it. But it's locker room talk and it's one of those things. I will knock the hell out of ISIS. We're going to defeat ISIS. ISIS happened a number of years ago in a vacuum that was left so because of bad judgment. And I will tell you, I will take care of ISIS. So Mr. And Trump we should get onto much more important things and much bigger things. Just for the record, though, are you saying that what you said on that bus 11 years ago, that you did not actually 
kiss women without consent or grope women without consent. I have great respect for women. Nobody has more respect for women than I do. So for the uh, record, said, you're saying you never did that. I things that, frankly, you, you hear these things, I said, and I was embarrassed by it, but I have tremendous respect for women. Have you ever and done those things? women have respect for me, and I will tell you, no, I have not, and I will tell you that I'm going to make our country safe. We're going to have borders on our country, which we don't have now. People are pouring into our country, and they're coming in from the Middle East and other places. Uh, we're going to make America safe again. We're going to make America great again, but we're going to make America safe again. And we're going to make America wealthy again, because if you don't do that, uh, it just and it sounds harsh to say, but we have to build up the wealth of Thank our you, nation Mr. Trump. right now. Other nations are taking our jobs, and they're taking our wealth. Thank you, Mr. Trump. And that's Trump. what I want to talk about. Secretary Clinton, do you want to respond? Well, like everyone else, I've spent a lot of time thinking over the last 48 hours um, about what we heard and saw. You know, with prior Republican nominees for president, I, I disagreed with them on politics, policies, principles, but I never questioned their fitness to serve. Donald Trump is different. I said starting back in June, that he was not fit to be president and commander in chief. And many Republicans and independents have said the same thing. What we all saw and heard on Friday was Donald talking about women, what he thinks about women, what he does to women. And he has said that the video doesn't represent who he is, but I think it's clear to anyone who heard it that it represents exactly who he is. Because we've seen this throughout the campaign. We have seen him insult women. We've seen him rate women on their appearance, ranking them from one to 10. We've seen him embarrass women on TV and on Twitter. We saw him after the first debate spend nearly a week denigrating a former Miss Universe in the harshest, most personal terms. So, yes, this is who Donald Trump is. But it's not only women, and it's not only this video that raises questions about his fitness to be our president, because he has also targeted immigrants, African Americans, Latinos, people with disabilities, POWs, Muslims, and so many others. So this is who Donald Trump is, and the question for us, the question our country must answer, is that this is not who we are. That's why, to go back to your question, I want to send a message, we all should, to every boy and girl, and indeed to the entire world, that America already is great, but we are great because we are good. And we will respect one another, and we will work with one another, and we will celebrate our diversity. These are very important values to me, because this is the America that I know and love. And I can pledge to you tonight that this is the America that I will serve if I'm so fortunate enough to become your president. And we want to get to some questions well, from online. Well, am I allowed to respond to that? I but, assume I am. Yes, you can respond to that. It's just words, folks. It's just words. Those words, I've been hearing them for many years. I heard them when they were running for the Senate in New York, where Hillary was going to bring back jobs to upstate New York, and she failed. I've heard them where Hillary is constantly talking about the inner cities of our country, which are a disaster education-wise, job-wise, safety-wise, in every way possible. I'm going to help the African Americans. I'm going to help the Latinos, Hispanics. I am going to help the inner cities. She's done a terrible job for the African Americans. She wants their vote, and she does nothing. And then she comes back four years later. We saw that firsthand when she was a United States Senator. She campaigned where the Mr. primary Trump, part Mr. of her Trump, campaign. I want to get to audience questions and online questions. So she's allowed to do that, but I'm not allowed to you're respond. Going to you're going to get to respond fair. right well, now. That sounds fair. This tape is generating intense interest. In just 48 hours, it's become the single most talked about story of the entire 2016 election on Facebook. 
with millions and millions of people discussing it on the social network. As we said a moment ago, we do want to bring in questions from voters around the country via social media, and our first stays on this topic, Jeff from Ohio, asks on Facebook, Trump says the campaign has changed him. When did that happen? So, Mr. Trump, let me add to that. When you walked off that bus at age 59, were you a different man, or did that behavior continue until just recently? And you have two minutes talk, for this. As I told you, that was locker room talk. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I am a person who has great respect for people, for my family, for the people of this country, and certainly I'm not proud of it. But that was something that uh, happened. If you look at uh, Bill Clinton, far worse, minor words, and his was action. His was what he's done to women. There's never been anybody in the history of politics in this nation that's been so abusive to women. So you can say any way you want to say it, but Bill Clinton was abusive to women. Hillary Clinton attacked those same women and attacked them viciously. Four of them are here tonight. One of the women, who is a wonderful woman, at 12 years old, was raped at 12. Her client, she represented, got him off, and she's seen laughing on two separate occasions, laughing at the girl who was raped. Kathy Shelton, that young woman, is here with us tonight. So don't tell me about words. I am absolutely, I apologize for those words. But it is things that people say. But what President Clinton did, he was impeached. He lost his license to practice law. He had to pay an $850,000 fine to one of the women, Paula Jones, who's also here tonight. And I will tell you that when Hillary brings up a point like that, and she talks about words that I said 11 years ago, I think it's disgraceful, and I think she should be ashamed of herself, if you want to know the truth. Can we please hold the applause? Secretary Clinton, you have two minutes. Well, first, let me start by saying that so much of what he's just said is not right, but he gets to run his campaign any way he chooses. He gets to decide what he wants to talk about. Instead of answering people's questions, talking about our agenda, laying out the plans that we have that we think can make uh, a better life and a better country, that's his choice. When I hear something like that, I am reminded of what my friend Michelle Obama advised us all. When they go low, you go high. And look, if this were just about one video, maybe what he's saying tonight would be understandable. But everyone can draw their own conclusions at this point about whether or not the man in the video or the man on the stage respects women. But he never apologizes for anything to anyone. He never apologized to Mr. and Mrs. Khan, the Gold Star family, whose son, Captain Khan, died in the line of duty in Iraq. And Donald insulted and attacked them for weeks over their religion. He never apologized to the distinguished federal judge who was born in Indiana. But Donald said he couldn't be trusted to be a judge because his parents were, quote, Mexican. He never apologized to the reporter that he mimicked and mocked on national television and our children were watching. And he never apologized for the racist lie that President Obama was not born in the United States of America. He owes the president an apology. He owes our country an apology. And he needs to take responsibility for his actions and his words. Well, you owe the president an apology because, as you know very well, uh, your campaign, Sidney Blumenthal, he's another real winner that you have. And he's the one that got this started along with your campaign manager. And they were on television just two weeks ago. She was saying exactly that. So you really owe him an apology. You're the one that sent the pictures around your campaign, sent the pictures around with President Obama in a certain garb. That was long before I was ever involved. So you actually owe an apology. And number two, Michelle Obama. I've 
gotten to see the commercials that they did on you. And I've gotten to see some of the most vicious commercials I've ever seen of Mo Michelle Obama talking about you, Hillary. So you talk about friend, go back and take a look at those commercials. A race where you lost, fair and square, unlike the Bernie Sanders race where you won, but not fair and square, in my opinion. And all you have to do is take a look at WikiLeaks and just see what they said about Bernie Sanders and see what Deborah Wasserman Schultz had in mind, because Bernie Sanders, between superdelegates and Deborah Wasserman Schultz, he never had a chance. And I was so surprised to see him sign on with the devil. But when you talk about apology, I think the one that you should really be apologizing for and the thing that you should be apologizing for are the 33,000 emails that you deleted and that you acid washed. And then the two boxes of emails and other things last week that were taken from an office and are now missing. And I'll tell you what, I didn't think I'd say this, but I'm going to say it, and I hate to say it, but if I win, I am going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation, because there has never been so many lies, so much deception, there has never been anything like it. And we're going to have a special prosecutor. When I speak, I go out and speak, the people of this country are furious. In my opinion, the people that have been long-term workers at the FBI are furious. There has never been anything like this where emails and you get a subpoena, you get a subpoena, and after getting the subpoena, you delete 33 thousand emails, and then you acid wash them, or bleach them, as you would say, a very expensive process. So we're going to get a special prosecutor, and we're going to look into it, because you know what? People have been, their lives have been destroyed for doing one-fifth of what you've done, and it's a disgrace, and honestly, you ought to be ashamed of Secretary yourself. Secretary Clinton, I want Martha, to follow let, up on that. Let, I'm going to let, let, let you talk about email. Because everything he just said is absolutely false, but I'm not oh, surprised. Really? In the first debate... And we in the really, first the debate, audience needs to I calm told down people here. that it would be impossible to be fact-checking Donald all the time. I'd never get to talk about anything I want to do and how we're going to really uh, make lives better for people. So, once again, go to HillaryClinton.com. We have literally Trump. You can fact-check him, fact -check, fact -check him in real time. Last time at the first debate, we had millions of people. Uh, fact-checking, so I expect we'll have millions more fact-checking uh, because, you know, it is, uh, it's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Yeah, because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. We want to remind the audience to please not uh, talk out loud. Please do not applaud. You're just wasting time. And, and Secretary Clinton, I do want to follow up on emails. You've said your handling of your emails was a mistake. You disagreed with Director, FBI Director James Comey, calling your handling of classified information, quote, extremely careless. The FBI said that there were 110 classified emails that were exchanged, eight of which were top secret, and that it was possible hostile actors did gain access to those emails. You don't call that extremely careless? Well, Martha, first let me say, and I've said it before, but I'll repeat it because I want everyone to hear it. That was a mistake, and I take responsibility for using a personal email account. Uh, obviously, if I were to do it over again, I would not. I'm not making any excuses. Uh, it was a mistake, and I am very uh, sorry about that. But I think it's also important uh, to point out where there are some misleading accusations from critics and others. Uh, after a year-long investigation, there is no evidence that anyone hacked the server I was using, and there is no evidence that anyone uh, can point to at all, anyone who says otherwise has no basis, that any classified material ended up in the wrong hands. I take classified materials very seriously and always have. When I was on the Senate Armed Services Committee, I was privy to a lot of classified material. Obviously, as Secretary of State, I had some of the 
most important secrets uh, that we possess, such as going after bin Laden. Uh, so I am very committed to taking classified information seriously, and as I said, there is no evidence uh, that any classified information ended up in the wrong hands. Okay, we're going to move on. And yet, she didn't know the word, the letter C on a document. Right? She didn't even know what that word, what that letter meant. You know, it's amazing. I'm watching Hillary go over facts, and she's going after fact after fact, and she's lying again because she said she, you know, what she did with the emails was fine. You think it was fine to delete 33,000 emails? I don't think so. She said the 33,000 emails had to do with her daughter's wedding, number one, and a yoga class. Well, maybe we'll give three or three or four or five or something. 33,000 emails deleted. And now she's saying there wasn't anything wrong. And more importantly, that was after getting a subpoena. That wasn't before. That was after. She got it from the United States Congress. And I'll be honest, I am so disappointed in congressmen including Republicans, for allowing this to happen. Our Justice Department, where her husband goes onto the back of an airplane for 39 minutes, talks to the Attorney General days before a ruling is going to be made on her case. But for you to say that there was nothing wrong with you deleting 39,000 emails, again, you should be ashamed of yourself. What you did, and this is after getting a subpoena, from the United States Congress. We have to move on. You Secretary Clinton, you can minute. respond, and we've got to move on. We, we want to give the audience the a, a, sector, a chance you'd be put here. in jail, let alone after getting a subpoena from the United States Secretary Congress. Secretary Clinton, you can respond, then we have to move on to an audience question. Look, it's just not true, and so please you, oh, go. Oh, you didn't delete to, them? You Allow her to respond, please. Were personal emails, not oh, official. 33,000? Yeah, not, right. well, we turned over 35,000, so oh, yeah. it was. What about the other 15,000? Uh, please allow her to respond. She didn't talk while you talked. Yes, that's true. I didn't. And I didn't in the say. first debate, and uh, I'm going to try not to in this debate because uh, I'd like to get to the questions that the people have brought here tonight uh, to talk to us about. And get off this question. Okay, Donald, I know you're into big diversion tonight, anything to avoid talking about your campaign and the way it's exploding and the way Republicans are leaving you, but let's, let's, let's at see least what focus on some response. of the let's issues that people care about tonight. Let's get to their question. We have a question here question. from Ken Karpowitz. He has a question about health care. Ken? I'd like to know, Anderson, why aren't you bringing up the emails? I'd like to know. Why aren't you we getting brought up to the, the emails. bottom? No, it hasn't. It hasn't. And it hasn't been finished at all. Ken Carpowitz has a question. It's nice to one on three. Thank you. Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare, it is not affordable. Premiums have gone up, deductibles have gone up, co-pays have gone up, prescriptions have gone up, and the coverage has gone down. What will you do to bring the cost down and make coverage better? That, that first one goes to Secretary Thank Clinton you. because you started out the last one to the audience. If he wants to start, he can start. Go ahead, Hillary. No, go ahead, Donald. No, I'm a gentleman, Hillary. Go ahead. Secretary Clinton? <laughs> well, I think Donald was about to say he's going to solve it by repealing it and getting rid of uh, the Affordable Care Act. And I'm going to fix it because I agree with you. Premiums have gotten too high, co-pays, deductibles, prescription drug costs, and I've laid out a series of actions that we can take to try to get those costs down. But here's what I don't want people to forget when we're talking about reining in the cost, which has to be uh, the highest priority of the next uh, president. When the Affordable Care Act passed, it wasn't just that 20 million people got insurance who didn't have it before, but that in and of itself was a good thing. I meet these people all the time and they tell me what a difference having that insurance meant to them and their families. But everybody else, the 170 million of us who get health insurance through our employers got big benefits. Number one, insurance companies can't deny you coverage because of a pre-existing condition. Number two, no lifetime limits, which is a big deal if you have serious health problems. Number three, women can't be charged more than men for our health insurance, which is the way it used to be before the Affordable Care Act. Number four, if you're under 26 and your parents have a policy, you can be on that policy until the age of 26, something that didn't happen before. So I want very much to save what works and is good about the Affordable Care Act. But we've got to get costs down. We've got to provide 
some additional help to small businesses so that they can afford uh, to provide health insurance. But if we repeal it, as Donald has proposed, and start over again, all of those benefits I just mentioned are lost to everybody, not just people who get their health insurance on the exchange. And then we would have to start all over again. Right now, we are at 90% health insurance coverage. That's the highest we've ever been in our country. Secretary Clinton, so I time's want us up. to get to 100%, but get costs down and keep quality up. Mr. Trump, you have two minutes. It is such a great question, and it's maybe the question I get almost more than anything else outside of defense. Obamacare is a disaster. You know it. We all know it. It's going up at numbers that nobody's ever seen worldwide. It's nobody's ever seen numbers like this for health care. It's only getting worse. In 17, it implodes by itself. Their method of fixing it is to go back and ask Congress for more money, more and more money. And we have right now almost $20 trillion in debt. Obamacare will never work. It's very bad, very bad health insurance far too expensive, and not only expensive for the person that has it, unbelievably expensive for our country. It's going to be one of the biggest line items very shortly. We have to repeal it and replace it with something absolutely much less expensive and something that works, where your plan can actually be tailored. We have to get rid of the lines around the state, artificial lines, where we stop insurance companies from coming in and competing, because they wanted President Obama and whoever was working on it, they want to leave those lines, because that gives the insurance companies essentially monopolies. We want competition. You will have the finest health care plan there is. She wants to go to a single-payer plan, which would be a disaster somewhat similar to Canada. And if you ever notice, the Canadians, when they need a big operation, when something happens, they come into the United States in many cases because their, their system is so slow. It's, it's catastrophic in certain ways. But she wants to go to single payer, which means the government basically rules everything. Hillary Clinton has been after this for years. Obamacare was the first step. Obamacare is a total disaster. And not only are your rates going up by numbers that nobody's ever believed, but your deductibles are going up. So that unless you get hit by a truck, you're never going to be able to use it. Mr. Trump, it is time. a disastrous plan, and it has to be repealed and replaced. Secretary Clinton, let me follow up with you. Your husband called Obamacare, quote, the craziest thing in the world, saying that small business owners are getting killed as premiums double, coverage is cut in half. Was he mistaken, or was his mistake simply telling the truth? No, I mean, he clarified what he meant, and, and it's very clear. Look, we are in a situation in our country where if we were to start all over again, we might come up with a different system. But we have an employer-based system. That's where the vast majority of people get their health care. And the Affordable Care Act was meant to try to fill the gap between people who were too poor and couldn't put together any resources to afford health care, namely people on Medicaid. Obviously, Medicare, which is a single-payer system, which takes care of our elderly and does a great job doing it, by the way. And then all the people who were employed, but people who were working but didn't have the money to afford insurance and didn't have anybody, an employer or anybody else, to help them. That was the, the slot that the Obamacare uh, approach was to take. And like I say, 20 million people now have health insurance. So if we just rip it up and throw it away, what Donald's not telling you is we just turn it back to the insurance companies the way it used to be. And Mr. that Clinton. means the insurance companies get to do pretty much whatever they want, including saying, look, I'm sorry, you've got diabetes, you had cancer, your child has asthma. Your time is up. You may not be able to have insurance because you can't afford it. So let's fix what's broken about it, but let's not throw it away and give it all back to the insurance companies Mr. and let the Let me follow companies. up with you, Mr. That's not going to work. Mr. Trump, let me follow up on well, this. I just want to just one thing. First let, of all, Hillary, everything's broken about it, everything. Number two. Bernie Sanders said that Hillary Clinton has very bad judgment. This is a perfect example of it, Mr. trying Trump, to save Obamacare, which is— You've said disaster. you want to end By Obamacare. You've said you want to end Obamacare. You've also said you want to make coverage accessible for people 
with pre-existing conditions. How do you force insurance companies to do that if you're no longer mandating that every American get insurance? Able to. You're going to have plans. What does that mean? That, well, I'll tell you what it means. You're going to have plans that are so good because we're going to have so much competition in the insurance industry once we break out, once we break out the lines and allow the competition to come. President are you, Obama are you going to have a mandate that Americans Anderson, have to have health insurance? Me. President Obama, by keeping those lines, the boundary lines around each state, and it was almost gone until just very toward the end of the passage of Obamacare, which, by the way, was a fraud. You know that. Because Jonathan Gruber, the architect of Obamacare, was said, he said it was a great lie. It was a big lie. President Obama said, you keep your doctor, you keep your plan. The whole thing was a fraud, and it doesn't work. But when we get rid of those lines, you have competition, and we will be able to keep pre-existing. We'll also be able to help people that can't get don't have money because we are going to have people protected. And Republicans feel this way, believe it or not, and strongly this way. We're going to block grant into the states. We're going to block grant into Med Medicaid into Thank the you, states Trump. so that we will be able to take care of people without the necessary funds to take care of themselves. Thank you, Mr. Trump. We now go to Gorba Hamid with a question for both candidates. Hi. There are 3.3 million Muslims in the United States, and I'm one of them. You've mentioned working with Muslim nations, but with Islamophobia on the rise, how will you help people like me deal with the consequences of being labeled as a threat to the country after the election is over? Mr. Trump, you're first. Well, you're right about Islamophobia, and that's a shame. But one thing we have to do is we have to make sure that because there is a problem. I mean, whether we like it or not, and we can be very politically correct, but whether we like it or not, there is a problem. And we have to be sure that Muslims come in and report when they see something going on. When they see hatred going on, they have to report it. As an example, in San Bernardino, many people saw the bombs all over the apartment of the two people that killed 14 and wounded many, many people. Horribly wounded. They'll never be the same. Muslims have to report the problems when they see them. And, you know, there's, a, there's always a reason for everything. If they don't do that, it's a very difficult situation for our country. Because you look at Orlando, and you look at San Bernardino, and you look at the World Trade Center, go outside, you look at Paris, look at that horrible, these are radical Islamic terrorists. And she won't even mention the word, and nor will President Obama. He won't use the term radical Islamic terrorists. Terrorism. Now, to solve a problem, you have to be able to state what the problem is or at least say the name. She won't say the name and President Obama won't say the name, but the name is there. It's radical Islamic terror. And before you solve it, you have to say the name. Secretary Clinton. Well, thank you for asking your question. And I've heard this question from a lot of Muslim Americans across our country because Unfortunately, there's been a lot of very divisive, dark things said about Muslims. And even someone like Captain Khan, the young man who sacrificed himself defending our country in the United States Army, has been subject to attack by Donald. I want to say just a couple of things. First, we've had Muslims in America since George Washington. And we've had many successful Muslims. We just lost a particularly well-known one with Muhammad Ali. My vision of America is an America where everyone has a place. If you're willing to work hard, you do your part, you contribute to the community, that's what America is, that's what we want America to be for our children and our grandchildren. It's also very short-sighted and even dangerous to be engaging in the kind of demagogic rhetoric that Donald has about Muslims. We need American Muslims to be part of our eyes and ears on our front lines. I've worked with a lot of different Muslim groups around America. I've met with a lot of them, and I've heard how important it is for them to feel that they are wanted and included and part of our country, part of our homeland security, and that's what I want to see. It's also important I intend to defeat ISIS, to do so in a coalition with majority Muslim nations. Right now, a lot of those nations are hearing what Donald says and wondering, 
Why should we cooperate with the Americans? And this is a gift to ISIS and the terrorists, violent jihadist terrorists. We are not at war with Islam. And it is a mistake, and it plays into the hands of the terrorists to act as though we are. So I want a country where citizens like you and your family are just as welcome as anyone else. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. Mr. Trump, in December, you said this. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. We have no choice. We have no choice. Your running mate said this week that the Muslim ban is no longer your position. Is that correct? And if it is, was it a mistake to have a religious test? First of all, Captain Khan is an American hero. And if I were president at that time, he would be alive today. Because unlike her, who voted for the war without knowing what she was doing, I would not have had our people in Iraq. Iraq was a disaster. So he would have been alive today. The Muslim ban is something that in some form has morphed into a extreme vetting from certain areas of the world. Hillary Clinton wants to allow and, and why did it morph excuse into me, that? No, did me. you? No, answer the question. Why do you, you still believe? Her? You I do. me all the time. Why don't you Would interrupt you her? Would you please explain whether or not the Muslim ban still stands? It's called extreme vetting. We are going to areas like Syria, where they're coming in by the tens of thousands because of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton wants to allow a 550 percent increase over Obama. People are coming into our country like we have no idea who they are, where they're from, what their feelings about our country is, and she wants 550 percent more. This is going to be the great Trojan horse of all time. We have enough problems in this country. I believe in building safe zones. I believe in having other people pay for them. As an example, the Gulf states who are not carrying their weight, but they have nothing but money, and take care of people. But I don't want to have, with all the problems this country has and all of the problems that you see going on, hundreds of thousands of people coming in from Syria when we know nothing about them. We know nothing about their values, and we know nothing about their love for our country. And Secretary Clinton, let me ask you about that, because you have asked for an increase from 10 to 65,000 Syrian refugees. We know you want tougher vetting. That's not a perfect system. So why take the risk of having those refugees come into the country? Well, first of all, I will not let anyone into our country that I think poses a risk to us. But there are a lot of refugees women and children. Think of that picture we all saw of that four-year-old boy with the blood on his forehead because he'd been bombed by the Russian and Syrian air forces. There are children suffering in this catastrophic war, largely, I believe, because of Russian aggression. And we need to do our part. We by no means are carrying anywhere near the load that Europe and others are. But we will have vetting that is as tough as it needs to be from our professionals, our intelligence uh, experts, and others. But it is important for us as a uh, policy, you know, not to say, as Donald has said, we're going to ban people based on a religion. How do you do that? We are a country founded on religious freedom and liberty. How do we? do what he has advocated without causing great distress within our own country. Are we going to have religious tests when people fly into our country? And how do we expect to be able to implement those? So I thought that what he said was extremely unwise and even dangerous. And indeed, you can look at the propaganda on a lot of the terrorist sites and what Donald Trump says about Muslims is used to recruit fighters because they want to create a war between us. And the final thing I would say, this is the 10th or 12th time that he's denied being for the war in Iraq. 
We have it on tape. The entire press corps has looked at it. It's been debunked, but it never stops him from saying whatever he wants has to say. Has not been debunked. So please has uh, not been debunked. And go I was to HillaryClinton.com against, against, and, and you can see it. I was against the war in Iraq. Has not been debunked. And you voted for it, and you shouldn't have. Well, I just want to There's been lots say, of fact-checking on me. that. I'd like to move on excuse to an me. online question. She just went about 25 seconds over her time. She Could did I not. just respond to this, please? Very quickly, please. Hillary Clinton, in terms of having people come into our country, we have many criminal illegal aliens. When we want to send them back to their country, their country says, we don't want them. In some cases, they're murderers, drug lords, drug problems. And they don't want them. And Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, said, that's okay, we can't force it into their country. Let me tell you, I'm going to force them right back into their country. They're murderers and some very bad people. And I will tell you uh, very strongly, when Bernie Sanders said she had bad judgment, she has really bad judgment because we are letting people into this country that are going to cause problems and crime like you've never seen. We're also letting drugs pour through our southern border at a record clip, at a record clip. And... It shouldn't be allowed to happen. ICE just endorsed me. They've never endorsed a presidential candidate. The Border Patrol agents, 16,500, just recently endorsed me. And they endorsed me because I understand the border. She doesn't. She wants amnesty for everybody. Come right in. Come right over. It's a horrible thing she's doing. She's got bad judgment, and honestly, so bad that she should never be president of the United States. That thank, I can tell thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trump. I want to move on. This next question comes from the public through the Bipartisan Open Debate Coalition's online forum where Americans submitted questions that generated millions of votes. This question involves WikiLeaks' release of purported excerpts of Secretary Clinton's paid speeches, which she has refused to release, and one line in particular in which you, Secretary Clinton, purportedly say you need both a public and private position on certain issues. So, two from Virginia asks, is it okay for politicians to be two-faced? Is it acceptable for a politician to have a private stance on issues? Secretary Clinton, well, your two minutes. Right. As, as I recall, that was uh, something I said about Abraham Lincoln uh, after having seen the wonderful Steven Spielberg movie called Lincoln. It was a master class watching President Lincoln get the Congress to approve the 13th Amendment. It was principled and it was strategic. And I was making the point that it is hard sometimes to get the Congress to do what you want to do, and you have to keep working at it. And yes, President Lincoln was trying to convince some people, he used some arguments, convincing other people, he used other arguments. That uh, was a great, uh, uh, I thought, a great uh, display of presidential leadership. But you know, let's talk about what's really going on here, Martha, because our intelligence community just came out and said in the last few days that the Kremlin, meaning Putin and the Russian government, are directing the attacks, the hacking on American accounts to influence our election. And WikiLeaks is part of that, as are other sites where the Russians hack information. We don't even know if it's accurate information. And then they put it out. We have never in the history of our country been in a situation where an adversary, a foreign power, is working so hard to influence the outcome of the election. And believe me, they're not doing it to get me elected. They're doing it to try to influence the election for Donald Trump. Now, maybe because he has praised Putin, maybe because he says he agrees with a lot of what Putin wants to do, maybe because he wants to do business in Moscow, I don't know the reasons, but we deserve answers. And we should demand that Donald release all of his tax returns so that people can see what are the entanglements and the financial and relationships we're going to get to that, later. that he has Secretary with Clinton, Russians and you're other out of foreign time. powers. Well, I think I should Mr. respond Trump. because it's so ridiculous. Look, now she's blaming, she got caught in a total lie. Her papers went out to all her friends at the banks, Goldman Sachs and everybody else. And she said things, WikiLeaks, that just came out. And she lied. Now she's blaming the lie 
on the late, great Abraham Lincoln. That's one that I have. Okay, Honest Abe. Honest Abe never lied. That's the good thing. That's the big difference between Abraham Lincoln and you. That's a big, big difference. We're talking about some difference. But as far as other elements of what she was saying, I don't know, Putin. I think it would be great if we got along with Russia because we could fight ISIS together as an example, but I don't know, Putin. But I notice anytime anything wrong happens, they like to say, the Russians, the Russians, she doesn't know if it's the Russians doing the hacking. Maybe there is no hacking, but they always blame Russia. And the reason they blame Russia is because they think they're trying to tarnish me with Russia. I know nothing about Russia. I know, I know about Russia, but I know nothing about the inner workings of Russia. I don't deal there. I have no businesses. I have no loans from Russia. I have a very, very great balance sheet, so great that when I did the old post office on Pennsylvania Avenue, the United States government, because of my balance sheet, which they actually know very well, chose me to do the old post office between the White House and Congress, chose me to do the old post office. One of the primary things, in fact, perhaps the primary thing, was balance sheet. But I have no loans with Russia. You could go to the United States government and they would probably tell you that because they know my sheet very well in order to get that development. I had to have. Now, the taxes are a very simple thing. As soon as I have, first of all, I pay hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. Many of our friends, took bigger deductions. Warren Buffett took a massive deduction. Uh, Soros, who's a friend of hers, took a massive deduction. Many of the people that are giving her all this money that she can do many more commercials than me gave her, took massive deductions. I pay hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes, but, but, as soon as my routine audit's finished, I'll release my returns. I'll be very proud to. They're Thank you, Mr. Quite Trump. Good. We've got a, uh, we're going to turn, actually, to the topic of taxes. We have a question from Spencer Moss. Spencer? Good evening. Uh, my question is, what specific tax provisions will you change to ensure the wealthiest Americans pay their fair share in taxes? Mr. Trump, you have two minutes. Well, one thing I do is get rid of carried interest. The, one of the greatest provisions for people like me, to be honest with you, I give up a lot when I run because I knock out the tax code. And she could have done this years ago, by the way. She's a United States, she was a United States Senator. She complains that Donald Trump took advantage of the tax code. Well. Why didn't she change it? Why didn't you change it when you were a senator? The reason you didn't is that all your friends take the same advantage that I do, and I do. You have provisions in the tax code that frankly we could change, but you wouldn't change it because all of these people give you the money so you can take negative ads on Donald Trump. But, and I say that about a lot of things. You know, I've, I've heard Hillary complaining about so many different things over the years. I wish you'd have done this. But she's been there for 30 years. She's been doing this stuff. She never changed, and she never will change. She never will change. We're getting rid of carried interest provisions. I'm lowering taxes, actually, because I think it's so important for corporations, because we have corporations leaving massive corporations and little ones. Little ones can't form. We're getting rid of regulations, which goes hand in hand with the lowering of the taxes. But we're bringing the tax rate down from 35% to 15%. We're cutting taxes for the middle class, and I will tell you, we are cutting them big league for the middle class. And I will tell you, Hillary Clinton is raising your taxes, folks. You can look at me. She's raising your taxes really high. And what that's going to do is a disaster for the country. But she is raising your taxes, and I'm lowering your taxes. That in itself is a big difference. We are going to be thriving again. We have no growth in this country. There's no growth. If China has a GDP of 7%, it's like a national catastrophe. We're down at 1%. And that's like no growth. And we're going lower, in my opinion. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that our taxes are so high, just about the highest in the world. And I'm bring, bringing them down to one of the lower in the world. And I think it's so important, one of the most important things we can do. But she is raising everybody's taxes massively. Secretary Clinton, you have two minutes. The question was, uh, what specific tax provisions will you change to ensure the wealthiest Americans pay their fair share of taxes? Well, everything you've heard, just now from Donald is not true. I'm, I'm sorry I have to keep saying this, but he lives in an alternative reality. And it is sort of amusing to hear somebody who hasn't paid federal income taxes in maybe 20 years talking about what he's going to do, but I'll tell you what he's going to do. His plan will give the wealthy and corporations 
the biggest tax cuts they've ever had, more than the Bush tax cuts by at least a factor of two. Donald always takes care of Donald and people like Donald, and this would be a massive gift. And indeed, the way that he talks about his tax cuts would end up raising taxes on middle class families, millions of middle class families. Now here's what I want to do. I have said nobody who makes less than $250,000 a year, and that's the vast majority of Americans, as you know, will have their taxes raised, because I think we've got to go where the money is, and the money is with people who've taken advantage of every single break in the tax code. And yes, when I was a senator, I did vote to close corporate loopholes. I voted to close, I think, one of the loopholes he took advantage of when he claimed a billion dollar uh, loss that enabled him to avoid paying taxes. I want to have a tax on people who are making a million dollars. It's called the Buffett Rule. Yes, Warren Buffett is the one who's gone out and said somebody like him should not be paying a lower tax rate than his secretary. I want to have a surcharge on incomes above $5 million. We have to make up for lost times because I want to invest in you. I want to invest in hardworking families. And I think it's been unfortunate, but un it's happened, that since the Great Recession, the gains have all gone to the top. And we need to reverse that. People like Donald, who paid zero in taxes, zero for our vets, zero for our military, zero for health and education. That is wrong, Thank and you, we're Secretary. going to make sure that nobody, no corporation and no individual can get away without paying his fair share to I support give you, our country. Mr. Trump, I want to give the chance to respond. Sure. I just want to tell our viewers what she's referring to. In the last month, taxes were the number one issue on Facebook for the first time in the campaign. The New York Times published three pages of your 1995 tax returns. They show you claimed a $916 million loss, which means you could have avoided paying personal federal income taxes for years. You've said you pay state taxes, employee taxes, real estate taxes, property taxes. You have not answered, though, a simple question. Did you use that $916 million loss to avoid paying personal federal income taxes for of years? Of course I do. Of course I do. And so do all of her donors, or most of her donors. I know many of her donors. Her donors took massive tax write-offs. So have a you lot of my, excuse me, Anderson, a lot of my write-off was depreciation and other things that Hillary, as a senator, allowed. And she'll always allow it because the people that give her all this money, they want it. That's why. See, I understand the tax code better than anybody that's ever run for president. Hillary Clinton, and it's extremely complex, Hillary Clinton has friends that want all of these provisions, including they want the carried interest provision, which is very important to Wall Street people, but they really want the carried interest provision, which I believe Hillary's leaving. It's very interesting why she's leaving carried interest, but I will tell you that, number one, I pay tremendous numbers of taxes. I absolutely used it, and so did Warren Buffett, and so did George Soros, and so did many of the other people that Hillary is uh, getting money from. Now, I won't mention their names because they're rich, but they're not famous, so we won't make them famous. Can, okay. you, can you say how many years you have avoided paying personal federal income taxes? No, but I, I pay tax, and I pay federal tax, too. But I have a write-off. A lot of it's depreciation, which is a wonderful charge. I love depreciation. You know, she's given it to us. Hey, if she had a problem, for 30 years she's been doing this, Anderson, I say it all the time. She talks about health care. Why didn't she do something about it? She talks about taxes. Why didn't she do something about it? She doesn't do anything about anything other than talk. With her, it's all talk and no action. In the past, and, and again, Bernie Sanders, it's really bad judgment. She has made bad judgment not only on taxes, she's made bad judgments on Libya, on Syria, on Iraq. I mean, her and Obama, whether you like it or not, the way they got out of Iraq, the vacuum they've left, that's why ISIS formed in the first place. They started from that little area, and now they're in 32 different nations, Hillary. Secretary, Congratulations, great job. Once you've been able to respond, Secretary Clinton. Well, here we go again. I've been uh, in favor of getting rid of carried interest for years, um, starting when I was a senator from New York. But that's not the point here. Why didn't you, you know, do it? Why didn't you do it? Well, because I was a senator with a Republican president. Oh, really? I will be the you president. You could have done it. If you, were an, effective, uh, if you exactly were an effective right. senator, you could have done it. If you were an effective senator, you could have done it. But you were not an effective senator. Please allow her to respond. She didn't interrupt you. You know, under our Constitution, presidents have something called veto power. Look, he has now said repeatedly, 
30 years this and 30 years that. So let me talk about my 30 years in public service. I'm very glad to do so. Eight million kids every year have health insurance because when I was first lady, I worked with Democrats and Republicans to create the children's health insurance program. Hundreds of thousands of kids now have a chance to be adopted because I worked to change our adoption and foster care system. After 9-11, I went to work with Republican mayor, governor, and president to rebuild New York and to get health care for our first responders who were suffering because they had run toward danger and gotten sickened by it. Hundreds of thousands of National Guard and Reserve members have health care because of work that I did, and children have safer medicines because I was able to pass a law that required the dosing to be more carefully done. When I was Secretary of State, I went around the world advocating for our country, but also advocating for women's rights to make sure that women had a decent chance to have a better life and negotiated a treaty with Russia to lower nuclear weapons. 400 pieces of legislation have my name on it as a sponsor or co-sponsor when I was a senator for eight years. I worked very hard and was very proud to be re-elected in New York by an even bigger margin than I had been elected the first time. And as president, I will take that work, that bipartisan work, that finding common ground, Thank because you. you have to be able to get along with people to get things done in Washington. Thank you, Secretary. And I've proven that I can, and for 30 years, I've produced results for Thank people. Thank you, Secretary. We're going to move on to Syria. Both of you have mentioned that. Well, she said a lot of things. We, you, you I mean, I think we should we can, be allowed no, to Mr. maybe Mr. Trump, we're going to go on. This is she about the audience. Because a disaster as a Mr. Senator. Mr. Trump, a we're going to move on. The heartbreaking video of a five-year-old Syrian boy named Amran sitting in an ambulance after being pulled from the rubble, rubble after an airstrike in Aleppo focused the world's attention on the horrors of the war in Syria, with 136 million views on Facebook alone. But there are much worse images coming out of Aleppo every day now, where in the past few weeks alone, 400 people have been killed, at least 100 of them children. Just days ago, the State Department called for a war crimes investigation of the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad and its ally, Russia, for their bombardment of Aleppo. So this next question comes from social media through Facebook. Diane from Pennsylvania asks, if you were president, what would you do about Syria and the humanitarian crisis in Aleppo? Isn't it a lot like the Holocaust when the U.S. waited too long before we helped? Secretary Clinton, we will begin with your two minutes. Well, the situation in Syria is catastrophic. And every day that goes by, we see the results of the regime, uh, by Assad in partnership with the Iranians on the ground, the Russians in the air, bombarding places, in particular Aleppo, where there are hundreds of thousands of people, probably about 250,000 still left. And there is a determined effort by the Russian Air Force to destroy Aleppo in order to eliminate the last of the Syrian rebels who were really holding out against the Assad regime. Russia hasn't paid any attention to ISIS. They're interested in keeping Assad in power. So I, when I was Secretary of State, advocated, and I advocate today, a no-fly zone and safe zones. We need some leverage with the Russians uh, because they're not going to uh, come to the negotiating table for a diplomatic uh, resolution unless there is some leverage over them. And we have to work more closely with our partners and allies on the ground. But I want to emphasize that what is at stake here is the ambitions and the aggressiveness of Russia. Russia has decided that it's all in in Syria, and they've also decided who they want to see become president of the United States, too, and it's not me. I've stood up to Russia, I've taken on Putin and others, and I would do that as president. I think wherever we can cooperate with Russia, that's fine. And I did as Secretary of State. That's how we got a treaty reducing nuclear weapons. It's how we got the sanctions on Iran that put a lid on the Iranian nuclear program without firing a single shot. So I would go to the negotiating table with more leverage than we have now. But I do support the effort 
to investigate for crimes, war crimes, committed by the Syrians and the Russians and try to hold them accountable. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. First of all, Mr. she Trump. was there as Secretary of State with the so-called line in the sand, which... No, I wasn't. I was gone. I hate to interrupt okay. you, but but you at were in some contact. Point, excuse me. At some you point, were, we need you to were do in some total contact here. with the White House, and perhaps, sadly, Obama probably still listened. To you. I don't think he'd be listening to you very much anymore. Obama draws the line in the sand. It was laughed at all over the world. What happened? Now, with that being said, she talks tough against Russia, but our nuclear program has fallen way behind, and they've gone wild with their nuclear program. Not good. Our government shouldn't have allowed that to happen. Russia is new in terms of nuclear. We are old, we're tired, we're exhausted in terms of nuclear. A very bad thing. Now, she talks tough. She talks really tough against, against uh, uh, Putin and against Assad. She talks in favor of the rebels. She doesn't even know who the rebels are. You know, every time we take rebels, whether it's in Iraq or anywhere else, we're, we're arming people. And you know what happens? They end up being worse than the people. Look at what she did in Libya with Gaddafi. Gaddafi's out. It's a mess. And by the way, ISIS has a good chunk of their oil. I, I'm sure you probably have heard that. It was a disaster. Because the fact is, almost everything she's done in foreign policy has been a mistake and it's been a disaster. But if you look at Russia, just take a look at Russia, and look at what they did this week, where I agree she wasn't there, but possibly she's consulted. We sign a peace treaty. Everyone's all excited. Well, what Russia did and with Assad, and by the way, with Iran, who you made very powerful with the dumbest deal perhaps I've ever seen in the history of deal making, the Iran deal with $150 billion, with the $1.7 billion in cash, which is enough cash to fill up this room. But look at, look at that deal. Iran now and Russia are now against us. So she wants to fight. She wants to fight for rebels. There's only one problem. You don't even know who the rebels are. Mr. Trump, Mr. So what's Trump, the you're two and, minutes And one thing up. I have to say, you're two minutes I don't is like up. Assad at all, but Assad is killing ISIS. Russia is killing ISIS, and Iran is killing ISIS. And those three have now lined up because of our weak foreign policy. Mr. Trump, let me repeat the question. If you were president, what would you do about Syria and the humanitarian crisis in Aleppo? And I want to remind you what your running mate said. He said, provocations by Russia need to be met with American strength and that if Russia continues to be involved in airstrikes along with the Syrian government forces of Assad, the United States of America should be prepared to use military force to strike the military targets of the Assad regime. Okay. He and I haven't spoken and I disagree. I disagree. You disagree with your running I think we have to man. knock out ISIS. Right now, Syria is fighting ISIS. We have people that want to fight both at the same time. But Syria is no longer Syria. Syria is Russia, and it's Iran, who she made strong, and Kerry and Obama, made into a very powerful nation and a very rich nation very, very quickly, very, very quickly. I believe we have to get ISIS. We have to worry about ISIS before we can get too much more involved. She had a chance to do something with Syria. They had a chance. And that was the line. What do you think and will happen did. if Aleppo falls? I think Aleppo is a disaster humanitarian What do you think will happen if it falls? Uh, I think that it basically has fallen, okay? It basically has fallen. Let me tell you something. You take a look at Mosul. The biggest problem I have with the stupidity of our foreign policy. We have Mosul. They think a lot of the ISIS leaders are in Mosul. So we have announcements coming out of Washington and coming out of Iraq. We will be attacking Mosul in three weeks or four weeks. Well, all of these bad leaders from ISIS are leaving Mosul. Why can't they do it quietly? Why can't they do the attack, make it a sneak attack, and after the attack is made, inform the American public that we've knocked out the leaders, we've had a tremendous success. People leave. Why do they have to say we're going to be attacking Mosul within the next four to six weeks, which is what they're saying? How stupid is our country? There are sometimes reasons the military does that. I, Psychological I can't warfare. Think of any. I can't think of any. It and might be to help get civilians Flynn, out. And we have, look, I have 200 generals and admirals who endorse me. I have 21 Congressional Medal of Honor recipients who endorse me. We talk about it all the time. They understand. Why can't they do something secretively where they go in and they knock 
out the leadership. How, why would these people stay there? I've been reading now Tell for weeks. Tell me what your Mosul. strategy is. I've been reading now is. for weeks about Mosul, that it's the harbor of where, you know, between Raqqa and Mosul. This is where they think the ISIS leaders are. Why would they be staying? They're not staying there anymore. They're gone. Because everybody's talking about how Iraq, which is us with our leadership, goes in to fight Mosul. Now, with these 200 admirals and generals, they can't believe it. All I say is this, General George Patton, General Douglas MacArthur are spinning in their grave at the stupidity of what we're doing in the Middle East. I'm going to go to Secretary Clinton. Secretary Clinton, you want Assad to go. You advocated arming rebels, but it looks like that may be too late for Aleppo. You talk about diplomatic efforts. Those have failed. Ceasefires have failed. Would you introduce the threat of U.S. military force beyond a no-fly zone against the Assad regime to back up diplomacy? I would not uh, use American ground forces in Syria. I think that would be a very serious mistake. I don't think American troops should be uh, holding territory, which is what they would have to do as an occupying force. I don't think that is a smart strategy. I do think the use of special forces, which we're using, uh, the use of uh, enablers and trainers in Iraq, which has had some positive effects, uh, are very much in our interests. And so I do support what is happening. But let so me So what just... would you do differently than President Obama is well, doing? Mar Martha, I hope that by the time I, if er I'm first, everything. I hope by the time I am president that we will have pushed ISIS out of Iraq. I do think that there is a good chance that we can take Mosul. Uh, and, you know, Donald says he knows more about ISIS than the generals. No, he doesn't. Uh, there are a lot of uh, very important planning going on, and some of it is to signal uh, to the Sunnis in the area, as well as Kurdish Peshmerga fighters, that we all need to be in this, and that takes a lot of planning and preparation. I would go after Baghdadi. I would specifically target Baghdadi, because I think our targeting of al-Qaeda leaders, and I was involved in a lot of those operations, highly classified ones, made a difference. So I think that could help. I would also consider arming the Kurds. The Kurds have been our best partners in uh, Syria, as well as Iraq. And I know there's a lot of concern about that in some circles, but I think they should have the equipment they need so that Kurdish and Arab fighters on the ground are the principal way that we take Raqqa after pushing ISIS out of Iraq. Thank you very much. We're going to you move know, on. She we went over a minute over, and you don't stop her. When I go one second over, it's like You a had big many deal. answers. It's really, it's really very interesting. We've got a question over here from uh, James Carter. Mr. Carter? My question is, do you believe you can be a devoted president to all the people in the United States? That question begins for Mr. Trump. Absolutely. I mean, uh, she calls our people deplorable, a large group, and irredeemable. I will be a president for all of our people, and I'll be a president that will turn our inner cities around and will give strength to people and will give economics to people and will bring jobs back because NAFTA, signed by her husband, is perhaps the greatest disaster trade deal in the history of the world, not in this country. It stripped us of manufacturing jobs. We lost our jobs. We lost our money. We lost our plants. It is a disaster. And now she wants to sign TPP, even though she says now she's for it. She called it the gold standard. And by the way, at the last debate, she lied, because it turned out that she did say the gold standard, and she said she didn't say it. They actually said that she lied, okay? And she lied, but she's lied about a lot of things. I would be a president for all of the people, African Americans, the inner cities, devastating what's happening to our inner cities. She's been talking about it for years. As usual, she talks about it, nothing happens. She doesn't get it done. Same with the Latino Americans, the Hispanic Americans. The same exact thing. They talk, they don't get it done. You go into the inner cities and you see it's 45% poverty. African Americans now 45% poverty in the inner cities. The education is a disaster. 
Jobs are essentially non-existent. I mean, it's, you know, I, and I've been saying at big speeches where I have 20 and 30,000 people, what do you have to lose? It can't get any worse. And she's been talking about the inner cities for 25 years. Nothing's going to ever happen. Let me tell you, if she's president of the United States, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be talk. And all of her friends, the taxes we were talking about, and I would just get it by osmosis. She's not doing any me favors. But by doing all the others' favors, she's doing me favors. Mr. Trump, thank but, you. But I will tell you, she's all talk. It doesn't get done. All you have to do is take a look at her Senate run. Take a look at upstate New York. Your two minutes is up. Secretary Clinton, two minutes. It turned out to be a disaster. You have two minutes, Secretary Clinton. Well, 67% of the people voted to re-elect me when I ran for my second term, and I was very proud and very humbled by that. Mr. Carter, I have tried my entire life to do what I can to support children and families. You know, right out of law school, I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund, and Donald talks a lot about, you know, the 30 years I've been in public service. I'm proud of that. You know, I started off as a young lawyer working against discrimination against African-American children in schools and in the criminal justice system. I worked to make sure that kids with disabilities could get a public education, something that I care very much about. I have worked with Latinos. One of my first jobs in politics was down in South Texas registering Latino citizens to be able to vote. So I have a deep devotion to use your absolutely correct word, to making sure that every American feels like he or she has a place in our country. And I think when you look at the letters that I get, a lot of people are worried that maybe they wouldn't have a place in Donald Trump's America. They write me, and one woman wrote me about her son, Felix. She adopted him from Ethiopia when he was a toddler. He's 10 years old now. This is the only country he's ever known. And he listens to Donald on TV, and he said to his mother one day, will he send me back to Ethiopia if he gets elected? You know, children listen to what is being said, to go back to the very, very first question. And there's a lot of fear that, in fact, teachers and parents are calling it the Trump effect. Bullying is up. A lot of people are feeling, you know, uneasy. A lot of kids are expressing their concerns. So first and foremost, I will do everything I can to reach out to everybody, Secretary Democrats, Clinton. Republicans, independents, people across our country. If you don't vote for me, I still want to be your president. Your I want to be the up. best president I can be for every American. Secretary Clinton, your two minutes is up. I want to follow up on something that Donald Trump actually said to you, uh, a comment you made last month. You said that half of Donald Trump's supporters are, quote, deplorables, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. You later said you regretted saying half. You didn't express regret for using the term deplor deplorables. To Mr. Carter's question, how can you unite a country if you've written off tens of millions of Americans? Well, within hours, I, I said that I was sorry about the way I, I um, talked about that because my argument is not with his supporters, it's with him and with the hateful and divisive campaign that he has run and the inciting of violence at his rallies and the very uh, brutal kinds of comments about not just women, but all Americans, all kinds of Americans. And what he has said about African Americans and Latinos, about Muslims, about POWs, uh, about immigrants, about people with disabilities, he's never apologized for. And so I do think that a lot of the tone and tenor that he has said, I'm proud of the campaign that Bernie Sanders and I ran. We ran a campaign based on issues, not insults, and he is supporting me 100 percent. Thank you. Because we talked about what we wanted to do. We might have had some differences, and we had a lot of debates. Thank you, Secretary. But we believed that we could make the country better, and I was proud of that. I'm give you a minute, 20 seconds. We have a divided nation. We have a very divided nation. You look at Charlotte. You look at Baltimore. You look at the violence that's taking place in the inner cities, Chicago. You take a look at Washington, D.C. We have a increase in murder within our cities, the biggest in 45 years. We have a divided nation because people like her, and believe me, she has tremendous hate in her heart. And when she said deplorables, she meant it. And when she said irredeemable, they're irredeemable. You didn't mention that. 
But when she said they're irredeemable, to me, that might have been even worse. She said she's some of them are irredeemable. She's got tremendous hatred. And this country cannot take another four years of Barack Obama. And that's what you're getting with her. Mr. Trump, let me follow up with you. In 2008, you wrote in one of your books that the most important characteristic of a good leader is discipline. You said if a leader doesn't have it, quote, he or she won't be one for very long. In the days after the first debate, you sent out a series of tweets from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., including one that told people to check out a sex tape. Is that the discipline of a good no, leader? No, it wasn't sex, check out a sex tape. It you, was just take a look at the person that she built up to be this wonderful uh, Girl Scout who was no Girl Scout. You mentioned by the, the way, just tape. so you understand, when she said 3 o'clock in the morning, take a look at Benghazi. She said, who's going to answer the call at 3 o'clock in the morning? Guess what? She didn't answer because when Ambassador Stevens... The question is, is that the discipline minute, of a good leader? 600 times. Well, she said she was awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. And she also sent a tweet out at 3 o'clock in the morning, but I won't even mention that. But she said she'll be awake. Who's got the famous thing? We're going to answer our call at 3 o'clock in the morning. Guess what happened? Ambassador Stevens, Ambassador Stevens sent 600 requests for help. And the only one she talked to was Sidney Blumenthal, who's her friend and not a good guy, by the way. So, you know, she shouldn't be talking about that. Now, tweeting happens to be a modern-day form of communication. I mean, you can like it or not like it. I have, between Facebook and Twitter, I have almost 25 million people. It's a very effective way of communication. So you can put it down, but it is a very effective form of communication. I'm not unproud of it, to be honest with you. Secretary Clinton, does Mr. Trump have the discipline to be a good leader? No. I'm shocked to hear that. Well, it's, it's, it's not only my opinion, it's the opinion of many others, uh, national security experts, Republicans, former Republican members of Congress. But it's in part because those of us who have had the great privilege of seeing this job up close and know how difficult it is, and it's not just because I watched my husband take a $300 billion deficit and turn it into a $200 billion surplus, and 23 million new jobs were created, and incomes went up for everybody, everybody. African-American incomes went up 33 percent. And it's not just because I worked with George W. Bush after 9-11, and I was very proud that when I told him what the city needed, what we needed to recover, he said, you've got it, and he never wavered. He stuck with me. And I have worked, and I admire President Obama. He inherited the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. That was a terrible time for our country. We have to move along. Nine million people Secretary lost their Clinton, jobs. We have to... Five million homes were lost. Secretary Clinton, we're moving trillion on. And $13 trillion dollars in family wealth was wiped out. We are back on the right track. He would send us back into recession with his tax plans. Secretary Clinton, we are moving to an audience question. We're almost out of time. We have, we have another. Mr. Trump, we're moving to an audience question. Since 1929, it is our country Mr. Trump, has the Secretary slowest growth Clinton, we and want jobs to get to are a the disaster. Audience. Thank you very much, both of you. <laughs> we have another audience question. Beth Miller has a question for both candidates. Um, good evening. Perhaps the most important aspect of this election is the Supreme Court justice. What would you prioritize as the most important aspect of selecting a Supreme Court justice? We begin with your two minutes, Secretary Clinton. Thank you. Well, you're right. This is one of the most important uh, issues in this election. Um, I want to uh, appoint Supreme Court justices who understand the way the world really works, who have real life experience, who have not just been in a big law firm and maybe clerked for a judge and then gotten on the bench, but you know maybe they tried some more cases. They actually understand what people are up against because I think the current court has gone in the wrong direction. And so I would want to see uh, the Supreme Court uh, reverse Citizens United and get dark, unaccountable money out of our politics. Donald doesn't agree with that. I would like the Supreme Court to understand that voting rights are still a big problem in many parts of our country, that we don't always do everything we can to make it possible for people of color and older people and young people to be able to exercise their franchise. I want a Supreme Court that will stick with Roe v. Wade and a woman's right to choose, and I want a Supreme Court that will stick with marriage equality. Now, Donald has put forth the names of some people that he would consider. 
And among the ones that he has suggested are people who would reverse Roe v. Wade and reverse marriage equality. I think that would be a terrible mistake and would take us backwards. I want a Supreme Court that doesn't always side with corporate interests. I want a Supreme Court that understands because you're wealthy and you can give more money to something doesn't mean you have any more rights or should have any more rights than anybody else. So I have very clear views about what I want to see to tend to change the balance on the Supreme Court. And I regret deeply that the Senate has not done its job and they have not permitted a vote on the person that President Obama, a highly qualified person, they've not given him a vote to be able to have the full complement of nine Supreme Court justices. I think that was a dereliction of duty. Uh, I hope that they will see their way to doing it, but if I am uh, so fortunate enough as to be president, I will immediately uh, move to make sure that we fill that. We have nine Thank justices you, Secretary and we Clinton. get to work on behalf of our people. Thank you. You're out of time, Mr. Trump. Justice Scalia, great judge, died recently, and we have a vacancy. I am looking to appoint judges very much in the mold of Justice Scalia. I'm looking for judges, and I've actually picked 20 of them, so that people would see, highly respected, highly thought of, and actually very beautifully reviewed by just about everybody, but people that will respect the Constitution of the United States. And I think that this is so important. Also, the Second Amendment, which is totally under siege by people like Hillary Clinton. They'll respect the Second Amendment and what it stands for, what it represents. Uh, so important to me. Now, Hillary mentioned something about uh, contributions, just so you understand. So I will have in my race more than $100 million put in of my money, meaning I'm not taking all of this big money from all of these different corporations like she's doing. What I ask is this. So I'm putting in more than, by the time it's finished, I'll have more than $100 million invested pretty much self-funding mine. We're raising money for the Republican Party, and we're doing tremendously on the small donation, $61 average or so. I asked Hillary, why doesn't she made $250 million by being in office? She used the power of her office to make a lot of money. Why isn't she funding, uh, not for $100 million, but why don't you put 10 or 20 or 25 or $30 million into your own campaign? It's $30 million less for special interest that will tell you exactly what to do. And it would really, I think, be a nice sign to the American public. Why aren't you putting some money in? You have a lot of it. You've made a lot of it because of the fact that you've been in office. You made a lot of it while you were Secretary of State, actually. So why aren't you putting money into your own campaign? I'm just curious. Well, Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to get on to one more question. But the question was about the Supreme Court, and I just want to quickly say— Very quickly. I respect the Second Amendment, but I believe there should be comprehensive background checks, and we should close the gun show loophole and close the online loophole. Thank you. We have, we we have one more question, as Mrs. Clinton. As we possibly can. We have one more question from Ken Bone about uh, energy policy. Ken? What steps will your energy policy take to meet our energy needs while at the same time remaining environmentally friendly and minimizing job loss for fossil power plant workers? Mr. Trump, two minutes. Absolutely. I think it's such a great question because energy is under siege by the Obama administration, under absolute siege. The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, is killing these energy companies. And foreign companies are now coming in buying our buying so many of our different plants, and then rejiggering the plant so that they can take care of their oil. We are killing, absolutely killing, our energy business in this country. Now, I'm all for alternative forms of energy, including wind, including solar, etc. But we need much more than wind and solar. And you look at our miners. Hillary Clinton wants to put all the miners out of business. There is a thing called clean coal. Coal will last for a thousand years in this country. Now we have natural gas and so many other things because of technology. We have unbelievable, we have found over the last seven years, we have found tremendous wealth right under our feet. So good, especially when you have 20 trillion in debt. I will bring our energy companies back. They'll be able to compete. They'll make money. They'll pay off our national debt. They'll pay off our tremendous budget deficits, which are 
are tremendous, but we are putting our energy companies out of business. We have to bring back our workers. You take a look at what's happening to steel and the cost of steel and China dumping vast amounts of steel all over the United States, which essentially is killing our steel workers and our steel companies. We have to guard our energy companies. We have to make it possible. The EPA is so restrictive that they are putting our energy companies out of business. And all you have to do is go to a great place like West Virginia or places like Ohio, which is phenomenal, or places like Pennsylvania, and you see what they're doing to the people, the miners and others in the energy business. It's a disgrace. Your time is up. Thank you, it's sir. It's an absolute disgrace. And actually, Senator, Senator Clinton, two minutes. Well, that was very interesting. Um, first of all, China is illegally dumping steel in the United States, and Donald Trump is buying it to build his buildings, putting steel workers and American steel plants out of business. That's something that I fought against as a senator and that I would have a, a trade prosecutor to make sure that we don't get taken advantage of by China on steel or anything else. You know, because it sounds like you're in the business or you're aware of people in the business, you know that we are now for the first time ever energy independent. We are not dependent upon the Middle East, but the Middle East still controls a lot of the prices. So the price of oil has been way down, and that has had a damaging effect on a lot of the oil companies, right? We are, however, producing a lot of natural gas, which serves as a bridge to more uh, renewable fuels, and I think that's an important uh, transition. We've got to remain energy independent. It gives us much more power and freedom than to be worried about what goes on in the Middle East. We have enough worries over there without having to worry about that. So I have a comprehensive energy policy, but it really does include fighting climate change because I think that is a serious problem. And I support moving toward more clean, renewable energy as quickly as we can, uh, because I think we can be the 21st century clean energy superpower and create millions of new jobs and businesses. But I also want to be sure that we don't leave people behind. That's why I'm the only candidate from the very beginning of this campaign who had a plan to help us revitalize coal country, because those coal miners and their fathers and their grandfathers they dug that coal out. A lot of them lost their lives. They were injured, but they turned the lights on and they powered our factories. I don't want to walk away from them, so we've got to do something for them. Senator but Clinton. the price of coal is down worldwide. So we have to look at this comprehensively, and up. that's exactly what I have proposed. I hope you will go to HillaryClinton.com and for we have more, my we have, entire policy. One we more have, audience question. We've sneaked in one more question, and it comes from Carl Becker. My question to both of you is, regardless of the current rhetoric, would either of you name one positive thing that you respect in one another? Mr. Trump, would you like to go first? Well, I, I certainly will because uh, I think that's a, a very fair and important question. Look, I respect his children. His children are incredibly able and devoted, and I think that says a lot about Donald. I don't agree with nearly anything else he says or does, but I do respect that, and I think that is something uh, that as a mother and a grandmother is very important to me. Uh, so. I believe that this election has become, in part, so, um, so conflict-oriented, so intense, uh, because there's a lot at stake. This is not an ordinary time, and this is not an ordinary election. We are going to be choosing a president who will set policy for not just four or eight years, but because of some of the important decisions we have to make here at home and around the world, from the Supreme Court to energy and so much else. And so there is a lot at stake. It's one of the most consequential elections that we've had. 
And that's why I've tried to put forth specific policies and plans, trying to get it off of the personal and put it on to what it is I want to do as president. And that's why I hope people will uh, check on that for themselves so that they can see uh, that, yes, I've spent 30 years, actually maybe a little more, uh, working to help kids and families, and I want to take all that experience uh, to the White House and do that every single day. Mr. Trump. Well, I consider her statement about my children to be a very nice compliment. I don't know if it was meant to be a compliment, but it is a great. I'm very proud of my children. And uh, they've done a wonderful job, and they've been wonderful, wonderful kids. So uh, I consider that a compliment. Uh, I will say this about Hillary. She doesn't quit. She doesn't give up. I respect that. I tell it like it is. She's a fighter. I disagree with much of what she's fighting for. I do disagree with her judgment in many cases. But she does fight hard, and she doesn't quit, and she doesn't give up. And I consider that to be a very good trait. Thanks to both of you. I want to thank both the, uh, the candidates. I want to thank the, uh, the university here. This concludes the town hall meeting. Our thanks to the candidates, the commission, Washington University, and to everybody who watched. Please tune in on October 19th for the final presidential debate that will take place at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Good night, everyone. And so ends the wild and wooly second 2016 presidential debate. I am John Heilman, and here at the Washington University Spin Room with my partner Mark Halpern for a special Bloomberg Politics post-game coverage of the history that you just witnessed tonight. Uh, we are <laughs> going to talk about a lot of things tonight, but Mark, just give me your first thoughts about what we just saw. Well, a lot of the early moments uh, went to the, the recent uh, allegations on both and, and uh, revelations on both sides. There you see Donald Trump with his family, uh, and family was front and center tonight. The debate closed with mentions of uh, Donald Trump's children. It started with uh, some pretty tough back and forth between the two. It's interesting. A lot of uh, uh, supporters of Donald Trump and some neutral observers thought Donald Trump had a, had a very strong night, a stronger night than the first debate. And a, um, and a a night filled, they thought, with some very strong moments. Many people believe that Hillary Clinton um, uh, took advantage of Trump's lack of coherence at some time, moments, and that she had a much better night, and that Donald Trump did not do anything like what he needed to do to get back in this race. So I'm still digesting it, but I would say I lean towards the latter. I, I, I don't think he had nearly a strong enough performance to change the dynamics of the race in which he is behind. Right. I, I, I think I would say my, my headlines out of this debate were um, that Donald Trump d performed well enough that the potential of a complete meltdown in the Republican Party tomorrow has been staved off. Yep. I think he performed still poorly in many respects, and especially in the first half hour of the debate, where some many Republicans were uh, commenting on what they saw as a meltdown in that first 30 minutes, which is obviously a very important part of the debate. Um, times when he seemed to be menacing, glowering at her, the sniffling continued. Um, there was a moment when he threatened to put to on the, something I've never seen before in a presidential debate. He basically threatened his opponent with jail time. Um, th there was a not a strong 30, first 30 minutes for her. She then spent a large part of the next hour or so on defense. And I think that part of the debate allowed Trump to salvage something. You know, we talked before about whether he could win this debate or whether the goal was survival. I think he has survived this debate. But I can't imagine anyone will say that he that he gained any additional votes tonight, and I think he probably lost some. You saw there briefly uh, Chelsea Clinton greeting Ivanka Trump. The two of them are friends. And yep. Again, you, you saw some of the harshest rhetoric I think I've ever heard uh, from both candidates, probably a little bit more from Mr. Trump, but from both candidates during the debate, a strange situation. Uh, they, you know, have the Clintons famously attended Donald Trump's wedding. Uh, they had a very positive relationship uh, before this campaign, and you see, uh, although their daughters are still friendly, you see just how much the thing has turned into 
pretty harsh negativity. And, and you're seeing now what happens at the end of all these town halls. Very few of the people in the audience actually got to ask questions, only a handful. Yeah. But almost all of them will get souvenir photos with uh, the Clintons right. and the Trumps. So another thing we saw from Donald Trump tonight, which I think is planting some seeds for things later, he criticized the moderators relentlessly throughout the debate for being unfair, for interrupting him too much. Uh, he at one point said that it was three on one. Uh, you know, Trump has on various times in this campaign sort of suggested there's a conspiracy against him, that it's a rigged system and so on. You could see him literally on the debate stage tonight starting to lay a predicate down for claiming that this debate was in some way tilted against him. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump throughout the evening spoke a lot in shorthand. He said a lot of things uh, that were on his mind. It certainly came better prepared without a doubt than he did in the first debate. Right. Uh, but uh, our, our general consensus view here, initial take is uh, good enough to uh, try to maybe stop the absolute widespread panic within the Republican Party, uh, but probably not good enough in the single performance uh, to change the dynamics of the race in which, I'll say again, he went into this weekend being behind and has had a hellish 24 hours, 48 hours of news coverage. We're going to be back throughout uh, the next half an hour, uh, take a break now, but have more coverage on Bloomberg uh, television and on Twitter. We're going to show you the top tweeted moments of the debate and some guests from both sides to talk about how they think their candidate did. John and I will be back here and we'll talk about, again, some of the statistics from the night right after this. to Bloomberg Politics coverage of the second presidential debate live on Bloomberg TV and live on Twitter. I'm Ramey Innocencio right here in New York City where our friends at Twitter have been meticulously tracking the top tweeted moments of the night and we have them for you right now. Tonight marks the most tweeted debate of all time passing the first presidential debate earlier this month and tonight the moment that got the most tweets came around 10 11 p.m. Eastern when both of the candidates talked about what they would do about the refugee crisis as well as civil war in Syria. Take a look. We will be attacking Mosul in three weeks or four weeks. Well, all of these bad leaders from ISIS are leaving Mosul. Why can't they do it quietly? Why can't they do the attack, make it a sneak attack, and after the attack is made, inform the American public that we've knocked out the leaders, we've had a tremendous success. People leave. Why do they have to say we're going to be attacking Mosul within the next four to six weeks, which is what they're saying? How stupid is our country? I would not uh, use American ground forces in Syria. I think that would be a very serious mistake. I don't think American troops should be uh, 
holding territory, which is what they would have to do as an occupying force. I don't think that is a smart strategy. I do think the use of special forces, which we're using, uh, the use of uh, enablers and trainers in Iraq, which has had some positive effects, uh, are very much in our interests. Now, the runners up for top tweeted moments of the debate were when Trump said he was, quote, a gentleman and let Clinton answer a question first. Also, when Trump said Clinton should be in jail. Now, the highest peak of Twitter chatter, which we've been tracking all night, was the Syria clip we just saw, which came more than an hour into the debate. Meanwhile, the top three issues that Twitter users discussed over the past 90 minutes were one, terrorism, two, foreign affairs, and three, the economy. We're going to send you back out now to the debate spin room in St. Louis, where Bloomberg Washington Bureau Chief Megan Murphy is standing by. Megan, take it away. Thanks so much for that, Ramey. Well, I'm joined here now in the spin room with two of our reporters, Kevin Cirilli and our national reporter, Sahil Kapoor. Kevin, I want to start with you. You cover Trump for us. You were at that extraordinary press availability earlier today at the Four Seasons where Donald Trump called that impromptu meeting some of Bill Clinton's chief accusers. What surprised you about tonight? Did he telegraph that move? And do you think he did well enough to stave off some of the crazy criticism of him that's coming from all corners? Megan, this was Donald Trump going nuclear, right? I mean, there's no other way you can describe it. He had his back up against a wall after a sexist, misogynistic tape came out just on Friday, it was, and really set the tone and really risked defining the rest of his candidacy between now and Election Day. We've seen over the past 24 hours a remarkable display in the conservative movement with Republican after Republican backing away from his candidacy. Yesterday in Trump Tower when he came down, I mean, the political scenes that we've seen just play out over the past 24 hours, we're going to be talking about for decades. But the bottom line is this. We in the traveling press corps walked in less than two hours before the start of a debate having no clue what we were walking into and see Trump's, I'm sorry, Clinton's accusers literally sitting next to the candidate himself. His tone was stark, his tone was serious, and his tone was essentially bring it on. And that's what we saw tonight. Now, whether that does enough to win over or win back the Republicans who left him, I don't think it does. And in talking with those, some of those Republicans as this debate was going on, quite candidly, they're frazzled and they're scared. Talking to sources within Trump, Trump world, they feel that this is Hillary Clinton, a rattled Hillary Clinton, and they feel this will give them enough momentum to somehow move forward. We're going to pick that apart about how, whether it rattled her, but I wanted to use yeah. you, Sahil. This really was, again, the tale of two debates. The first 30 minutes, a sort of really smash mouth, really nasty. I think there were many of us in that room watching it that actually did not know whether we'd actually get through the entire debate. <laughs> they didn't shake hands to start, and it started right off in a battle between them. But it was a different tone for the remaining hour, when it focused on more on policy, and I think many people would expect it. Did Hillary Clinton really take her opportunity tonight? Did she really effectively end this campaign? I don't think so. I think it ended up essentially being a tie. I think Hillary Clinton could have really hammered Trump on the, the impacts and the consequences of that tape, really kind of, as a woman herself, the first woman who's ever stood on a stage like that, pointed out just how offensive that was to so many women. And it's penetrated in a huge, huge way. And not just to women. In public. Of course, not just to women. But she's in a unique position yeah. to make that yeah, case, is what I mean. And she didn't quite do that. She also didn't mention the several dozen Republicans who have abandoned him. She had one moment where she seemed a little bit rattled when he kept on interrupting her and said, you know, you're just upset that, she said, Donald, you're just upset that a bunch of Republicans are leaving you. She could have taken that further. She could have done that more methodically. In the first debate, her strategy was to rattle him, was to exploit his temperament. She did not do that in this debate, but she did, I think, score points when we got to the policy section. She well, let's, demonstrated a much stronger knowledge of issues like Syria and the Middle East than Trump was able to do. That's not surprising, but let's break down some moments, because I think when we go through it, we almost forget some of them. There was a moment tonight, Kevin, where Donald Trump admitted that he actually had not been in discussion with his own running mate, Governor Mike Pence, yes. about their strategy on Syria, saying, I don't talk to him, and moreover, I disagree with his strategy on Syria. Does that surprise you? What are we likely to see about an already embattled VP candidate 
over the rest of the week? Well, Pence World is silent tonight. We have not heard from Pence World. I've been reaching out to them repeatedly tonight. Their messaging coming out of this, they need to prove whether or not they are with Donald Trump or against Donald Trump. But clearly, that is the moment of division that this campaign is going to have to answer for. Now, on the flip side of that, I think that Trump had a really strong moment, particularly on the email server, because this was not a moment in the past that he was able to capitalize on cohesively before tonight. And to see him push back on, on her talking about Lincoln, the movie, I think was one of his arguably strongest debate moments that we've seen. This, this may have been the first time we saw a presidential candidate throw his vice presidential nominee under the bus on live TV during a debate. I've never seen anything like that before. I don't think I've, I've ever no seen anything like before. that either. Pence's way of dealing with the situation where he disagreed with Trump, and we know they disagree on a lot of things, was to kind of brush it off and to, and to pretend Donald Trump didn't quite say the thing that he's on tape saying. Trump's way was to flatly refute it, and I think it will very much intrigue the Clinton campaign that the one that the thing that he refuted Pence on was confronting Russia and their aggression because they already have this argument that Trump is too close to Russia. Quickly, I just want to make one point because I think that to many people who watch this debate, candidly, the majority of people who watch this debate, the takeaway is this. These are our two options, and I think that is really going to be the broad takeaway from the tone, from the style, and from the messaging that both of these candidates, for very different reasons, put forward in that display that we just watched. Well, let's get to brass tacks here. We're talking about a campaign where Donald Trump is, you know, whether he can get over 40%, yeah. how high her unfavorable is, how, un how unlikable they both are. But when we look at this and we think, did anyone actually gain voters tonight? Did anyone watch? that debate actually say I'm shifting my opinion because of what was said I, he played a lot to the base mm -hmm. she played a lot to the policy I don't think she made enough of the women card as well either this evening towards sealing that deal did anyone actually change their mind I doubt it I doubt this debate moved a whole lot of voters but I think that tie goes to Hillary Clinton she doesn't need to expand her appeal she has the numbers she just needs to keep them and I don't think she lost any support tonight she needs to keep them and she needs to make sure they turn out Donald Trump does need to expand his appeal he's losing ground he has been losing ground of a last couple of weeks, even before, since the first debate, even before this tape came out, which is probably not going to help with suburban women, with white college-educated women. I think that's a pretty safe assumption. Um, so Trump needed to help himself. He needed to expand his appeal. He did not do that. He was on offense all night. He drove two messages home, which is that she's dishonest, that she's a liar. He said that over and over again, and that he's a change agent. And she's been in politics for 30 years, hasn't achieved these things that she wants to achieve. Now, inside the bubble, we know it's more complicated than that, but outside the bubble, I think that really resonates with people. So. You know, we'll see what, what happens with that. Kevin Sahel, thanks so much for joining again. We've got to take another break, but we'll be back more from the Washington University debate, the second presidential debate from the spin room after this break.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Politics and Twitter's live coverage of the second presidential debate here from Washington University in St. Louis. I'm joined now by Boris Epstein, a senior advisor for the Trump campaign. Boris, break it down for us. How did your man do tonight? Absolute home run. He knocked it out of the park. It was a great night. Strong, resolute. At 100% won this debate, won the, won the town hall. And he was great both on why he should be president and prosecuting the case against Hillary Clinton on her emails, on her failures, and on her whole history. We've talked a lot tonight how many of us were surprised by sort of the impromptu press appearance with some of Bill Clinton's accusers just moments, just less than two hours away from this debate tonight. Tell me some of the psychology of that. Was he trying to rattle Hillary Clinton? Was it trying to move on from the video? Tell us why you think so you did that. These are some of the women, just some of the women, whose lives were ruined by the Clinton machine and specifically by Hillary Clinton. In the case of the accusers, she smeared them. Hillary Clinton shamed those women. In the case of the woman whose rapist Hillary Clinton uh, defended, look at the laugh at that poor woman who was raped when she was 12 in the case of Ms. Shelton. So Mr. Here's Mr. Trump just giving voice to those women and working for those women just like he will for all Americans once he's president. Well, let's break down the facts on this. We had Friday night the release of a video which shows him using words that anyone would describe as vulgar, as demeaning, which he's apologized for. Completely unbefitting, anyone would say about the president of the United States, let alone your boss at work. Did he actually do enough to separate himself from a conference? You say he apologized. I didn't really hear him apologizing that much tonight. Of course. I heard him say, I'm a different man, but I didn't hear him say, this is a different kind of rhetoric. He defended his locker room banter. He apologized. Is it really locker room he banter? He apologized on Friday twice. Do you think it's fair to characterize those contexts as locker room banter? He apologized on Friday twice. He apologized today. He, of course it's locker room banter. He was obviously joking around with Billy Bush on Access Hollywood, uh, and it was, you know, it was a joking back and forth. But Mr. Trump has been very specific in that he apologized for that language. He, his wife said it was offensive and that she's ready to move on. And this country needs to move on to issues that actually matter, to national security, to the economy, to foreign policy. Hillary Clinton has failed this country on Iran, on Syria, on Libya, Benghazi, on and on and on. She's failed on everything she's ever done. She could not be allowed to be president. Well, let's talk about another extraordinary moment in tonight's debate, which is Donald Trump saying on camera that he actually didn't listen to his own vice presidential advice about issues and the issue of security is, uh, on Syria, and that he hadn't heard Mike Pence's comments on the issue, that he didn't know his strategy, and in fact, he disagreed. How is Mike Pence going to respond to that? What is going well, forward? Is so that effectively described their relationship? What Governor Pence was talking about was the safe zones, which the Trump-Pence ticket is absolutely agreeing on. The, as far as the safe zones, those are necessary and have to be protected. The Trump-Pence ticket has also been very consistent that we need to defeat ISIS first. Eighty percent of people killed by ISIS have been killed in the last three years. We need to defeat ISIS first. And then we have to deal with Assad. What do you think his? Do you think he's done enough to get beyond what we've seen? This mass exodus of senior Republicans, this mass call for him to actually leave the ticket to have someone else stand in. Did he do enough to? come back with a campaign that many people have said is dead in the water. 100 percent, not just with the establishment Republicans. He did amazing today with the voters. Don't, don't forget, 14 million people voted for him in the primaries. Tons of millions support him now. Tonight was a great night for Mr. Trump. We'll move on from here to Las Vegas, where he'll do great in that debate, and then to winning on November 8th. He showed himself to be the man that I know, somebody who's determined, who loves this country, who is not a liar like Hillary Clinton, and who will work for all Americans once he's president. Do you think he's going to be able to attract women voters. Did he do enough with, with women voters tonight, specifically women who are in states like Ohio, Pennsylvania? People are on the face who look at who want a better future for their children, who want a better future for not only their little girls but their little boys, and who look at the kind of comments that we saw on Friday night and say, "That's too much for me. That goes beyond the pale." Listen, women. Men, all Americans, want this country to be protected, want Americans to work. And it's clear that Hillary Clinton, in her 40 years in public service, has failed at doing both the protection and making sure Americans work. Look at her policies. She wants to raise taxes. Donald Trump wants to cut taxes. That's what Americans care about, not locker room banter from 11 years ago. And that's why Donald Trump will be elected on November 8th. Thanks, Boris, so much for your time Thank tonight. Thank you so much. And I'm sure you'll be uh, talking quite a lot tonight about the victory that it's was It's going to be tonight. a fun night. We're very excited. Thanks. We want to bring in now Senator Claire McCaskill coming in with Mr. Heileman. Thank you, John Megan Heilman. Murphy. I'm back um, with Claire McCaskill, the senator from Missouri. Senator, what'd you think? Well, there were a couple of um, moments that were shocking to me. Uh, I think maybe the most shocking was we are all pretty sure that Donald Trump is not listening to anybody. 
I'm pretty sure his advisors said not a good idea to go after Miss Universe at three in the morning on, and ask people to look up sex tapes. But I thought he might be listening to Mike Pence. Uh, his acknowledgement that he and Mike Pence had not even discussed uh, an important foreign policy issue, and more importantly, that he would say, I haven't talked to him about it and I disagree with him. Mm -hmm. um, there was a gasp in the room because um, it just shows this is not someone who uh, is capable of putting together a team right. that he would listen to. There are a lot of Republicans who I think the main question for them is, will, would Donald Trump melt down tonight completely, and would we have a, a complete conflagration tomorrow? Do you have a sense that Trump has survived this debate? Do you feel as though uh, that he's done enough that he will still be the person Hillary Clinton's running against uh, a week from now? Well, I think he, um, I think he's definitely going to be the person that Hillary Clinton's running against. And, you know, his the expectations were so low for Donald Trump, especially on top of the weekend he just had. I mean, he's got an awful lot of Republicans abandoning him. I'm not sure he stopped that tonight with the stunt he pulled before the debate began. I think the stunt was really bad. And there we have the picture you're seeing on screen right now. You're seeing the Clintons getting ready to make their departure from the debate site. You can see the back of Bill Clinton there as he's about to jump in that car uh, and exit the debate site. Um, Senator, uh, my, my other question for you is whether uh, whether you had a sense, and I think there are a lot of Republicans who are very critical of Donald Trump, that he had a, a difficult time in the first 30 minutes or so of the debate, but after that, seemed to exhibit at least a fair, a greater degree of preparation for this debate than he did the previous debate. Did you sense that, I mean, he seemed to have done some degree of research. We heard references to Jonathan Gruber. Uh, we heard references to Sidney Blumenthal. There were a variety of different places where you could get a sense they maybe have been studying. Did you have that sense tonight? Well, once again, very low expectations, very low bar. I will admit he said the same phrase over and over and over again, but he did throw in a few research points. Um, but uh, several times he failed, too. I mean, he didn't understand Chinese steel. He, clearly, um, she had a better grasp of energy policy than he did. And also foreign policy, I think he showed some real weaknesses. Um, did you think uh, there were, like, yet another, another, I think, widespread perception was that Senator Clinton was on defense for a decent chunk of the night in the middle of the debate. Um, did you feel like she held up relatively well at that point when she was taking tough questions both from the audience and from, and from the moderators and from Trump? I think she did. Um, I think she held up very well. Uh, I, I think there really was a contrast. I mean, I, I think people forget that Donald Trump, we, we've gotten used to Donald Trump just saying the same things over again. I'm great. I'm wonderful. Let's get along with Putin. I'll defeat ISIS. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. I, I think people don't realize how little substance there really is. We've kind of gotten, like, in near to it. And it's right. like we don't realize he still doesn't say much. And he still didn't say much tonight. What do you think we're going to be talking about tomorrow from this debate. We know these debates are about moments. You've been in a fair number of debates yourself. Usually the next day we look up, there are two or three things that we talk about and chew over for the next 24 to 48 hours. What are we going to be doing that about uh, in the aftermath of this debate? I think there'll be a fair amount of talk about the defiant, desperate, tacky attempt uh, at a stunt before the debate and, right. you know, parading the women in there in the front row, um, trying to somehow unsettle Hillary Clinton. I think people will be talking about that. I don't think that helps Donald Trump. I don't think that helps him with Republicans, by the way, that are really cautious about having anything to do with this guy now. And I think also it was a really, uh, a, the hate in the heart, I thought was really tough and, and, and offensive. And then the whole thing that he hadn't even talked to Mike Pence and they disagree. You're, you're, from a, you're from a purple state that a couple months ago people talked about Missouri maybe being in play in this race. Is there a chance you think Missouri will be in play? Missouri is in play. Missouri is in play at the presidential level. It Claire is. McCaskill promises that's, that, that that's the case. It's the case. All right. Thank you, Claire thank McCaskill, you. very much. Thanks for being here. We're going to cut to Mark Halperin right now, if we can get him in the spin room. He's out there trying to get some debates. I think we're still going to try and catch him to see what guests he's got. So what did you, th what do you think about, John, in terms of what the senator was just saying? Do you think that Hillary did enough tonight? Particularly, I was surprised that she didn't really ram home on women and picking up as much on the video and her connection with female voters as I would have expected. Yeah, I thought that Hillary Clinton was not at her best tonight. 
But for the reasons, part of the reasons that Claire McCaskill suggested, and for some of, the, some of these moments, I mean, again, they are like thea purely theatrical. People are still focused on Donald Trump sniffling, right? I mean, it was. I, I thought it was. Ball. I thought it was even worse tonight than I it was agree. in the first debate. I think the notion of Trump uh, basically accused, uh, trying to uh, claim that he was going to going to throw throw his opponent in jail if he became president of the United States was a pretty dramatic moment. But I believe we have Mark now elsewhere in the spin room. Mark Halpern out there. Come in, partner. Telling the truth, you don't have any trouble talking. So it didn't feel upsetting to, as you said, this was the first time you've seen him other, in person other than on TV. I'm That's upsetting. That it doesn't upset me to see her. It disgusts me. But, but to see him, oh, yeah, and I just saw him down the way. But he, yeah, he's such a vile person. Who contacted you to come to me? Did you to come tonight? I don't know who it was. Was it a long planning to get you out here to St. Louis? Uh, I had already started home from my Breitbart interview, and uh, I think it was Breitbart that said the invitation had been extended, and I gladly accepted. Would Thank you do you. other appearances? Thank you. 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 It's kind of an extraordinary moment here in the spin room to have someone who is coming here to accuse a former president of the United States of sexual assault, which he's done in the past, but to come here and do this as part of the Republican nominee's campaign. It's extraordinary. It's emotional for anybody watching this to see the kind of accusations being made. And she echoed what Donald Trump has said, which is she's making an accusation about a physical act versus Donald Trump's words. It's quite something. And uh, we, we're going to hope to see Mr. Trump in the spin room here, but there's a lot of emotion and intensity here, not the normal fare that you get in the spin room. So let me go back to you. Well, it's going to be hard. For All right. That was Mark Halpern in the spin room talking to Juanita Braddock. Yeah. Um, Megan, you give me a sense of what you thought um, in terms of, um, we've all talked about the key demographic in this election now, uh, co college-educated, suburban, yep. Republican-leaning women turned off in various ways by yep. Donald Trump throughout the campaign. Do you think Trump did anything tonight to help with that problem? I don't think he did anything to help with that problem. I don't think anything tonight to really separate himself, frankly, from the comments we saw on Friday. What I do think he was very effective is what you were talking about earlier. He was more prepared tonight. Yeah. He had positions on things like Obamacare. He actually had the beginnings of a foreign policy in terms of Syria, although he wasn't pushed as hard. He went quite, you know, he was effectively able to talk about taxes this evening. He talked about, you know, stuff. It was a more policy-centric debate for that middle hour than I think a lot of people expected. I don't think he's, there was nothing in that debate on either side, I think, that really would have swung independent voters and said, I really want to move to that candidate. But he, it was not the car crash that people expected, I think, tonight, and he will be able to move on tomorrow. Right. Right. I, will say, I will say the one question mark that looms still is the question of Mike Pence. Yeah, couldn't agree more. We had this. We had this. We thought tonight that if Trump's performance was bad enough, the question was, would Mike Pence stick with Donald Trump if his performance was terrible? By many lights in the Republican Party, Trump's performance was poor but not disastrous. On the other hand, he threw Mike Pence under the bus tonight. Completely. And so there is some reporting coming out of, Trump, out of Pence's camp that his people are apoplectic um, and furious and enraged by the way Trump treated Pence tonight on stage, given that Trump, although Pence was not fully supportive of Trump over the weekend, Pence has sort of stuck with Trump. So the question now becomes, even if Trump managed to survive this debate, what is the cost uh, for, with in terms of his running mate, and what does Mike Pence do tomorrow when he wakes up having thought about the way this debate went and the way in which he was treated by Donald Trump in front of 60, 70, 80 million well, people? We'll see the viewer. I mean, I think your Pence watch is certainly in hyperdrive right now. And just to remind viewers, the the uh, the moment that we're referring to is when Donald Trump basically said in an incredibly dismissive way, "I don't even talk to Mike Pence," and they were talking about Syria specifically, and I disagree with what he said as the policy. So that was quite a moment, I think, and we'll have to watch whether or not he can actually move forward. He already has had cut right. to his sort of moral center this issue about the video and what, right. how he can move forward just with his own family. And his we, we, we saw the dismissal of, of Pence as a running mate, and we also saw Trump essentially taking a position on Syria that's totally at odds with the position that Pence put forward in the vice presidential debate. Uh, the extraordinary spectacle of Donald Trump basically s defending, siding with uh, Bashar al-Assad tonight on stage, yeah. which is another thing that I think when we come down to substance in this debate, we'll get 
get a lot of discussion tomorrow because it is obviously a huge foreign policy issue and an issue on which Trump, again, contradicted his running mate and said things that are uh, will be provocative to not just a lot of Democrats, but a lot of Republican foreign policy people. And we Mark, should say to people that the top tweeted moment out of the debate was actually the exchange on Syria, which yes. I think will surprise a lot of people. Right. And it was not about locker room the, manner. The, Welcome the, back, Mark Halperin. The top to be back and out of the scrum. The top tweeted moment in the moment in the, in the debate that was the most tweeted debate in history. And we all had put so much emphasis on the first debate and how many how big the audience would be. But all the buildup over this weekend, apparently this debate, at least among Twitter followers, this was a bigger debate in some respects than the first debate. Yeah. You know, I've talked about four Trump people between going to the spin room yeah. and coming back. And, you know, they, they are, their attitude is they won the debate. They're going to say that. But I think they're right. They do live to fight another day. They yes. do put the brakes on what could have been effectively the end of the campaign. But I will ask you this question. We thought that that Trump's performance would might affect Mike Pence tomorrow. His performance was not horrible, but he did throw Mike Pence <laughs> under the bus tonight. So what does Mike yeah. Pence do tomorrow? Uh, he probably has a, a, a heart to heart with Donald Trump about that moment. But yeah. I don't think that's enough. He's, he's put up with a lot more than just a, a, a barb at the debate, uh, I would say. All right. So Megan Murphy, Mark Halperin, uh, and me, John Hyam, and we want to say thanks to our friends at Twitter, our exclusive partners for this Bloomberg Politics debate night coverage, both pregame and this postgame segment. Be sure to tune into our show with all due respect live at 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg TV tomorrow. And until then, I say to you for Megan, for Mark, for me, sayonara. It's 12 past 11 a.m. in Hong Kong. I'm Angie Lau. And I'm David Inglis. We're in the middle of the Asian trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. No handshake as the war of words turns personal. Clinton says Trump's not fit to be president. He says he'd put her in jail. Samsung reeling from a new smartphone blow. Well, top U.S. carriers dropping the Note 7 and reports say production has also been suspended. Still smiling, the Bank of Japan governor tells Bloomberg he has plenty of ammunition left in the fight to revive the economy. And commodity trader Noble raises more than a billion dollars by selling a U.S. energy unit. Shares are surging in Singapore. Well, they were sparring during the U.S. presidential debate. That's certainly the focus. But of course, for us here in Asia, China coming back online after Golden Week holiday. How are they doing today? Yeah, that's a very interesting point to make because I think when you look at what's happening across markets in Asia, China's really the standout, whether it's 
whether it's the equity market, whether it's a bond market, whether it's a currency. Yeah. In fact, have a look, have a long, uh, come along now and have a look at my Bloomberg right now. We're running the GMM function, of course. Very interesting and quick way to get started in your trading session. As you can see, China CSI 300 really outperforming right now, playing catch up, of course, with the exception of property plays every single sector is up in China. Obviously, investors are reacting to these new property curves. We'll get more on that in just a moment. Have a look at the renminbi, also standing out, down half of 1%. Biggest drop in the currency uh, since the Brexit vote. Now, the other market I want to point out as well, let me just flip my boards very quickly, and you look at the bottom side here of what's happening across equity markets. Thailand, 2.3% down. You look at the bots also getting sold off half of 1%. Six straight day of declines here for the bot. In fact, that's the longest streak going back to 2015. And also the bond markets are getting sold off. 10-year yield in Thailand up six basis points, 2.23 now. And your five-year up 4.3. So again, two markets in focus today. We're looking at China. We're looking at Thailand. We'll talk more a bit later on. In the meantime, let's get the first word news with Heidi. David, picking up from what you were saying, China's central bank has allowed the yuan to slip past 6.7 to the dollar, weakening that reference rate beyond that level for the first time in six years. The PBOC acted after the Golden Week holiday that saw the offshore rate declining, foreign exchange reserves shrinking and the dollar strengthening. China has been managing the yuan's decline for fear of exacerbating capital outflows. Well, the Bank of Japan's governor, Haruhiko Kuroda, says the bank has no plans to give up on accommodative policy and still has room for, to increase stimulus. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, he said there is no intention to reduce the bank's bond buying program until that 2% inflation target is achieved and stable. I don't think we can uh, reduce <laughs> uh, the purchase program soon. I mean, we have to maintain this uh, low level of interest rate to uh, uh, stimulate the economy and to achieve the 2% inflation target. The pound could turn from prop to pain for the UK economy, with investors worried that the government's approach to Brexit may mean foregoing access to the single market. Sterling has extended declines after last week's biggest tumble since that vote to leave the EU in June. The pound slide has helped cushion the UK economy from Brexit fallout, but continued weakness may undermine that role. It's now known that 18 people were killed when Hurricane Matthew hit the southeastern United States and at least five more are still unaccounted for. At its height, the storm cut power to almost 400,000 homes and businesses in Florida, with more than a million affected in Georgia and the Carolinas. Matthew triggered flash floods as much as 100 miles inland from the coast. It's now weakening and moving east. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Heidi Lung. This is Bloomberg. Well, there's no doubt, David, that the second presidential debate turned personal as Hillary Clinton <laughs> and Donald Trump clashed in St. Louis. Yep, Trump dismissed the controversy over his comments about women and targeted Hillary Clinton over her emails and allegations of sexual misconduct by her husband. Clinton fired back by saying Trump wasn't fit to be president and called on voters to show him that this is not, quote, who we are. What we all saw and heard on Friday was Donald talking about women, what he thinks about women, what he does to women, and he has said that the video doesn't represent who he is, but I think it's clear to anyone who heard it that it represents exactly who he is. I didn't say that at all. I don't think you understood what was said. This was locker room talk. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I apologize to my family. I apologize to the American people. Certainly, I'm not proud of it. But this is locker room talk. Well, Bloomberg Politics reporter Kevin Cirilli joins us now from St. Louis. Uh, Kevin, no doubt everybody's uh, clamoring to figure out who came out on top. But it wasn't even the moderators. They got attacked a few times <laughs> by Trump. <laughs> you know, I think what was remarkable is that Donald Trump came into this debate with his back up against a political wall. 
uh, just under two hours before this debate even started, I was in a room with him as well as his traveling press corps, watching him with three of Hillary of Bill Clinton's accusers, and he went politically nuclear against the Clinton machine. He pushed back, he fought back, he brought up numerous accounts of their infidelities as well as accusations against the Clintons that have been well storied over the years, and he went after them hard. The word that I'm hearing from the Trump campaign sources that I'm speaking with is they feel Hillary Clinton was quote unquote rattled. Now, of course, whether or not this does anything to stop the bleeding, to stop the Republicans who have denounced Donald Trump's candidacy over the past 48 hours remains to be seen. But clearly, Donald Trump showing tonight he is not going to back down and he is not dropping out of this race. Right, Kevin, David here in Hong Kong as well. I mean, certainly when you look at the currency market, so obviously the Mexican peso is one of the barometers we use uh, in, I guess, telling yes. whether the markets determine whether uh, Trump, Trump was successful. Now, that being said, I think what, other, what stood out as well was that there was more discussion and debate on policy and platforms. Absolutely. And I think that was quite remarkable, really, because after the first 20 minutes or so, after the political food fight, if you will, was out of the way, and make no mistake, these are sexist, misogynistic comments that needed to be discussed. But then the conversation did turn to policy, particularly on foreign policy, where Donald Trump said, in, in essence, that he did not consult his running mate, Governor Pence, on key issues of foreign policy, in particular of how to deal with terrorism. We also saw Donald Trump on the attack against Hillary Clinton for the use of her private email server. Hillary Clinton continued to hammer Donald Trump, saying that he does not have the temperament to be president, that he does not have the bona fides to be president. And clearly, this Clinton campaign really forcefully pushing back, saying that this he is just simply unfit to be president. But this was a debate that's going to be studied for decades to come, to say the least. All right. Uh, Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli, they're live for us in Missouri just after, of course, that second U.S. presidential debate. Now, let's move things along, because reports from South Korea, uh, in fact, uh, are we doing this hour? Yep, well, we're looking at, well, still ahead this hour, Jack Ma's off to Hollywood. We'll take a look at why China's richest man is joining forces with none other than Steven Spielberg. Could we see another Indiana Jones? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Plus, China gets off to a positive start following the Golden Week break, but it's not such good news for anyone. We're going to ask Ecognosis Advisory's Andrew Ferris what he sees in store for the currency next. This is Bloomberg.